Good evening and welcome to this year's Anne Spencer Memorial Lecture. I'm Ed Davis, I'm the Anglican and Coordinating Chaplain at the University. And on behalf of the whole chaplaincy, I'm really pleased to welcome you here this evening. For those of you who haven't attended this annual event before, it was founded 18 years ago in memory of Anne Spencer, a former member of staff at the University. It's made possible by a grant from the Spencer Charitable Trust and aims to facilitate discourse between faith, academia and everyday life. And I'm delighted that Professor Barnett has been able to come and speak to us this year on a theme that is of such relevance to the university and the world beyond. Ronald Barnett is Emeritus Professor of Higher Education at the Institute of Education, University of London. He's a recognised authority on the conceptual and theoretical understanding of the university and higher education. He has over 200 papers and 19 books to his name, several of which have won prizes and have appeared in other languages. His latest book is Being a University, published in 2011. As well as his research and teaching, he's held senior management positions at the Institute of Education including as Dean responsible for teaching and learning and quality matters, and as a pro-director responsible for longer-term strategy. He contributes to numerous national bodies, for example, having served as chair of the Society for Research into Higher Education, and more recently as a special advisor to the House of Commons Select Committee, inquiry into universities and students. He's also a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford, and a member of the Church of England Higher Education Group. And he's influential at an international level, having worked with universities in China, Australia, India and the West Indies, and having been a keynote speaker in over 30 countries. So it's a huge privilege to have Professor Barnett here to speak to us this evening on the title of Imagining the University at this time of significant change within higher education. Many of us have been concerned about the impact of those changes on the wider benefits that universities have brought to the world around. How can universities continue to fulfill our highest aspirations in the midst of powerful economic and political drivers? And certainly as a chaplaincy, this is an exploration that we've been really keen to facilitate. So, Professor Barnes, it's great to have you here with us. Let's give him a warm welcome as he comes. Well, hello, everybody. It's a great delight uh, and honour to be here uh, with you today, uh, giving this uh, very special lecture. Um, And I feel privileged to be standing in front of you Um, I'm going to share um, some thoughts with you, as you see, about what it might be to imagine the university. Um, I want to thank Ed Davis and the chaplaincy for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes. Um, I think, I'm not sure, have we got handouts? uh, uh, I hope many of you have got them. Fantastic. So if you get a a bit bored with uh, my standing in front of you, you can zip ahead and see where the story is going. I always like, when I'm out there, I like to know how many slides are coming. You can see how many are coming. Um, So, uh, and you can see the progress that we're making as we go through. Um, So, let's get cracking and see how we get on. Um, I want to, uh, by the way, um, I ought to just start with a bit of a health warning. Can you all hear me? Are you all right at the back? Um, that uh, I call myself a social philosopher. I'm interested in using philosophical perspectives, but I'm trying to bring them to bear on uh, the real world. People charge me we're not living in the real world, but I'm going to try and do that a bit. But I'm also trying to use, as I say, some, some philosophical perspectives to do so. Um, so um, my, my talk may seem a bit abstract, but I want you to feel that it comes out of my own experience. Um, I've just given you a sense of some of the things I've been up to 
in higher education over the last 40 years. And a lot of what I have to say really comes out of and is fueled by and is energised by my own experience. Often it's irritation with my own experience uh, that leads me to uh, be energised um, uh, and, and to, to try and formulate a few thoughts. So what, just what is it um, to imagine the university? Um, what and why is this important to try to imagine the university? What's the role that the imagination can play for us today? And what are its limitations? Because it can't do everything clearly. And what are its, what's its structure? I want to give you a structure for the very idea of the imagination. What are its prospects? And I remark, I just reflect, um, Ed having given me this challenge of coming here today and given the origins and the locus of this talk that behind this whole idea of getting to grips with what it is to imagine the university stands a further idea which I won't get into today but which you might want to pick up and that's belief in the university. Can we believe in the university anymore in the 21st century and what might that be? That seems to me a related issue to what I want to say. So why, why might it be important to try to think about what it is to imagine the university? Well, I want to start off by saying that it's important because the contemporary debate about the university is hopelessly impoverished. And, and, and both of those terms, hopelessly and impoverished, are, are doing work in that phrase, and I'll come to that in a moment. The current debate, it seems to me, and I don't know whether you share this feeling, is, is, hope, is, is unduly narrow. It's dominated, and don't we see it in the newspapers and in the public debate all the time, by a very limited range of ideas about the marketplace and competition and students as customers and even in some of the books knowledge for sale universities are, are now expected to think about what it is they can put into the marketplace and generate an income from and issues of audit and regulation these seem to be some of the ideas around which we're supposed to understand higher education these days and it seems to me that there are in this landscape three big ideas of the university, which certainly I'm unhappy about. I don't know whether you are too, and they are the entrepreneurial university, the corporate university, and even the bureaucratic university. And these ideas, subtle, implicit, tacit ideas of the university, provide a dominant discourse through which we're being enjoined to understand the university. They, they are yielding, it seems to me, a, what we might call a conceptual stranglehold. It's almost as if there's no way out of this way of looking at universities and higher education these days. But I want to say that we shouldn't be too gloomy and too pessimistic. We should at least see what spaces there might be in all of this for imagining the university anew. But firstly, my claim that this conceptual landscape is hopelessly impoverished. It's impoverished because, as I say, it's very narrow and it's exerting a, a dominant influence. And it lacks considerations, it seems to me, of well-being, of trying to do things better for the world of, at the global and even the personal level lacks a sense of there might be further possibilities in front of the university in the 21st century that we've never even thought about. It lacks a care for the potential of the university and the challenges that face us. Not in the 12th century as I've got up there, but the 21st century. It's remarkable what a, a coach ride can do. Um, but as I want to say, this conceptual landscape is not just impoverished, but it's also hopelessly impoverished. Why? Because it's lacking hope, it's lacking visions 
for the future. Lacking a sense that things perhaps might come out or could come out better for the university. And perhaps even in quite some fundamental ways. So that's the beginning set of reflections, the hopelessly impoverished landscape that faces us at the moment. Some critics and commentators remarking all this, remarking on all of this, fall into great gloom and despondency. And the literature is bedeviled, it seems to me, with undue pessimism and We've seen the books that emerge with titles like The Crisis in the University and The University in Ruins. The commentators and the critics, the theorists, the academics, get very gloomy about all of this. Well, pessimism is not without its merits, as has been remarked. It helps us get to grips with the real world sometimes, But it can lead to an unremitting bleakness, a sense that we're all hopelessly lost. And this seems to me the character of much of contemporary scholarship on higher education. Um, If you haven't read some of the papers in the literature, don't worry, you're not missing much. (laughs) They're characterised by this sort of Vocabulary over and over again. You see the almost the jargon words, the mantra words of commodification, neoliberalism, quality regimes, managerialism, performativity. If I see one more paper with, with the word performativity in and the regulative or evaluative state, these are the kinds of words and vocabulary that dominates. the the intellectual um, commentary on what is going on and undue pessimism so what's my position well it's not trying to look on the contrary for an undue optimism on the other side but simply an effort to try to see whether things could go better and in what ways we might imagine them to go better can we work towards what we might term a grounded optimism or even a bit of Ron Barnettism here, positive possibilism. What is possible? Not, ne- not necessarily what is likely, but what's possible in the 21st century for the university. And I want to search here in extending the imagination, opening up the imagination to what I call feasible utopias. This seems perhaps an oxymoron. How can you have utopias which are feasible all at the same time? But this is what I want to search for in imagining the university anew. Identifying possibilities which are admittedly value-laden. Reaching out to the best of the university of what it might be in the 21st century. Utopias which probably might not be reached. Why not? Because of the huge forces that are encircling and are acting upon the university. But perhaps some of these utopias might not be out of reach altogether. And perhaps we might even sometimes, somewhere, perhaps even in some departments in Bristol University, who knows, identify some examples, some tentative examples of utopias at work already there, hardly noticed already instances embryonically visible. So our philosophy has empirical warrant, as the modern European philosophers Guattari and Deleuze have remarked. And so we have here a muted pessimism, a sense that things might not go better, and it might be difficult for them to go better. So there's a bit of pessimism here. But it's muted because we might have a sense that things could, in the best of all possible worlds, actually go better. Feasible utopias. So what I'm opening up here with you this evening is a critical project of the imagination. I'm seeing a large role for the imagination. At least potentially. And here... Only, it's the only slide which has a bit of, as it were, a bit of the literature in it, so just forgive me, hang on for, for one minute. But I just want to 
open up here the concept of the imaginary, as it's recently been called in the literature. Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has been developing this idea, the imaginary. And by the imaginary, he means collective sentiments, as it were, buried in our collective psyche, buried in our culture, through which we come to understand ourselves. And one of his students, Kearney, now already a uh, dominant figure, a f- significant figure in the literature, has picked up this idea of the imaginary and has developed, as I would call it, it's not his term, a psychophenomenology of the imagination in which he looks to imaginaries, as it were, as extending stories through which we come to understand ourselves. How do we understand ourselves? How do we understand the university collectively amongst us? in the 21st century. We do it through imaginaries. We, we come to have a sense of what the university is, a tacit, implicit sense that we don't examine all that often. But if we're looking seriously at the idea of the imaginary, we have to take note of a book hardly ever noticed, and that's a book called The Imaginary by Sartre in which Sartre, as you might imagine, as an existentialist, looks to the imaginary as extending our possibilities, as extending our freedoms. It's not his phrase, but I read it into his work. Through the imagination, we strike out for freedom. We become ourselves, we can become ourselves in different ways. And so there is here a critical project opening up. Through the imagination, we can identify shortcomings in the present. We can articulate imaginative concepts which stand as critical standards with which to view and judge and assess our contemporary ideas and even our contemporary institutions. I'm opening up here to, if we might term it like this, a responsible anarchism. I want to bring in to contact with the idea of the imagination, the idea of responsibility. So we have here a complex set of relationships. I want to say in the first place the imagination should fly, should have a space to fly, unconstrained, to envision what my colleague Louise Morley has called brilliantly new conceptual grammars. How can we understand, can we find a new language for understanding the university? But I want to say this project has to be guided by responsibility, in which we perhaps search for a new poetry of the university, but we try to be alert to the, as it were, the real world in which the university has to live, a responsibility towards the real world. So the motto of Ron Barnett's talk this evening might be head in the clouds and feet on the ground all at once. This imagination has to be anarchic on the one hand and responsible on the other. And I take it that even poets have to live in the real world occasionally. It's an exercise in what we might call imaginative critical realism. Being real and being critical and imaginative all at once. Here are some ideas of the university, just a few. Many of them are in the literature, one or two I've added. I'll leave you to try and uh, identify which ones I've added. The point of this slide is, first of all, to remind ourselves, to begin to remind ourselves that there are already scudding around quite a lot of ideas of the university. You'd hardly know it. And by the way, I've got a list like this that extends to about 80, 80 phrases, just like this, that take this form. And you note the form of each phrase. Each phrase has three words in, and they, they all, they're all similar in, in two of those words. The formal structure of each phrase is the same, but they vary, I want to say, they vary considerably in their imaginative weight. Each one of those phrases is actually imaginative. Even to call a university a research university, as doubtless Bristol wants to do, is actually to be imaginative about it. It's to pick out certain aspects of a university and to say, let's see it in this way rather than that way. It is to be imaginative. But I want to say the imaginative weight of some of those uh, has more weight than others. The liquid university, the therapeutic university the ecological university. Perhaps some of these have more imaginative content 
than some of the others. So, what does it mean then to imagine the university? We're already getting a sense that to imagine the university is actually quite a complex task. Imagination is not a unitary phenomenon. And we can identify different forms of the imagination, different ways in which the imagination can come into play in helping us to understand the university. And here are some forms of the imagination, and I want to work through these very, very swiftly, if you'll let me. We're seeing here, us getting a sense that the imagination has a structure, or could be said to have a structure. So let's work through these pretty swiftly. The romantic imagination, or we might to say the historical imagination, but just by the way, most people who look back to the university seem to always think that the university was better in the past. What we call, might call the metaphysical university. The, the university that lasted for about 700 years, actually, beyond the medieval age in which the university was associated with an inquiry into man's relationship with the universe through notions of God and truth with a capital T and spirit and then the liberal university and then the civic university the service university and the research university the research university is already old hat already passing by already (coughs) slipping away the romantic imagination the university that which some people still want to hang on to, still long to be in. The empirical imagination, trying to get a sense of how things really are today, contemporarily, in, the, in quotes, the real world. And here are some from, if you like, from the more critical literature. The bureaucratic university, the corporate university, the marketised university, the commodified university the capitalist university, the performative university. If you come across any of these phrases, you can't have escaped them or something like them if you've been, as I've had to do, I'm afraid, for the last several years, read some of the literature. The empirical imagination, trying seriously to get to grips with how things are in the contemporary world. It's a complex phenomenon, actually, the university today. The ideological imagination. The ideological imagination is that imagination which not only tries to understand the world, but tries also to project forward big projects in the world. Tries to say, not only see the world in this way, but let's go forward to bring off these big ideas, these big projects. And the biggest of all, the biggest example of all, in the ideological imagination is of course that of the entrepreneurial university because when people by and large talk about the entrepreneurial university or at least there is a big literature uh, along these lines whereby talk about the, the entrepreneurial university is a carrier, a vehicle for trying to project the entrepreneurial university forward trying to say this is not only how the university is emerging, but how it jolly well ought to go on in the future. We all ought to become entrepreneurial universities, shouldn't we? The whole world is going in this direction, we're told, by this literature. And it's right that it should do so. We ought to get on board the train, because it's going anyway in that direction. Associated with the entrepreneurial university are other ideas like the enterprise university and so on. But there are other forms of the ideological imagination, it seems to me. Some people want to reclaim the, the idea of the open university, trying to give it new life in the 21st century. Seeing in, for example, the internet, new possibilities of developing openness in contemporary society. And many universities around the world are exploiting the possibilities of the internet, putting all their research projects on the internet, putting all their courses on the internet, available for public consumption, the open university. So it's not just a description, it's a value judgment, and it's a projection of a set of ideas in which some people are trying to project the university forward in the way they would wish. And we see to now talk about the European University. Can the university be developed so as to help to develop a European consciousness 
in the 21st century. And some people are talking about the global university. What might that mean? In a world of difference, can the university be brought into play so as to help form a kind of global consciousness in which we live together in a crazy world? We live amidst our differences, and some want to project a postmodern university, whatever that might mean. Some, dare I say, more sensitive critics um, I want to use the imagination to say all is not lost. We can use the imagination to further projects of hope for the university. There are possibilities emerging in the 21st century for the university, which we've hardly glimpsed up to now. The university's had 900 years of history, but now in the 21st century, real possibilities are opening for it, so it has to decide for itself where it is going in a way it never has had to in the past. In the past, we knew what a university was. Now there are real choices opening up in front of the university, choices which offer some hope for the university, contending against the bleakness that we were seeing earlier. And here are some ideas that might, we might put under that, category of the hopeful imagination. The borderless university, the university that's ducking and diving, has a sense of it working in the world without clear borders, no clear geographical borders, no clear physical borders. The network university, the liquid university, have you come across any of these ideas? I take the liquid university not directly from Bauman, but Bauman has extraordinary, he's about what is he in his 80s now? He's still writing a book a year. Disgraceful. Um, um, at least. Um, uh, but he is put into the vocabulary this whole idea of liquidity, the liquid world, the liquid society. Doesn't that give rise to the liquid university? Don't we sense that it's very difficult these days to get a hold of the university? Some philosophers, I mentioned Deleuze and Guattari, have got the, the image in their, in their writing of the, the rhizome. I'm not a bi biologist, but they talk about a rhizome as an unstructured phenomenon going off in all sorts of directions. I think it's far too static a metaphor. I talk about the university as a squid. The university has tentacles. It reaches out all over the world these days in all sorts of places. It gets into all sorts of crevices. It can move very, very quickly. The liquid university, the super complex university, somebody called Barnett put that one into the, into the we won't, so we won't dwell on, dwell on that. The therapeutic university, can the university help us live with our anxiety in a crazy world, in a mixed up world? The edgeless university, again this approaches the, the, the liquid and the borderless university person called Bradwell has written a little book comes out of a think tank about the university exploiting again modern technologies the edge of this university living on the edge not, not a fixed entity trying to exploit possibilities in the world, the hopeful imagination but many as I say are gloomy are pessimistic saying it's not living in the real world to have hope and fall back into dystopian ideas. What kinds of dystopian ideas might we put here into this dystopian imagination? Well, we haven't yet seen books with these titles, but surely they're not far, far in, uh, long in coming. We'll soon see them, surely, in the bookshops. The soulless university, the subservient university, and so on and so forth. The self-important university. I'm sure, I'm sure Bristol isn't that... <laughs> but I'm sure one, we can think of one or two universities which seem to be like that these days. The problem is the dystopian university is not out there waiting to come, it's already arrived. It's a combination of the ideological and the actual. It's already with us. What am I doing here? I'm trying to say, the, yes, let's exploit, build up, project the imagination. What, but what work can it do? It's, the imagination is not unitary. 
it, it, we might call upon it if we're not careful for, for bad purposes, for purposes that are not going to fulfill the potential of the university. So we can imagine a structuring of the imagination itself. And I, what I'm, I think is at work here underneath what I've said to you already are three axes through which we can, as it were, interrogate any idea of the university. Any idea of the university when we might come up with, I think we can place it on three axes. Is it simply endorsing the contemporary forces at work, or is it being critical of them? Is it riding on the surface of where we are, or is it attending to the deep forces at work in modern and contemporary society around the world? And is it pessimistic or is it optimistic? Haven't those axes been present and tacit in what I've said to you already? So if we take, for example, the entrepreneurial university, this is the big idea of the moment. How would we, where would we place that in this box space now opened up by these three axes? It seems to me it's an endorsing imaginative idea, it's an endorsing idea. It simply endorses how things are going already, the university and the marketplace... It is actually, surprisingly, a deep idea of the university. It's hence the deep structure. It's aware of the university and the knowledge economy, the global knowledge economy. And it's optimistic. It's full of breezy optimism about how the university is going. And we can can apply this treatment to any idea that we might come up with. These placing and any, any imaginative idea... Uh, along uh, and within these three axes. Why is that important? What I want to do here is to see whether we can come up with ideas, imaginative ideas of a certain kind. So the challenge that's opening up by this analysis already is this. Can we identify and imagine ideas and forms of the university that do not succumb unduly to ideology? as I think, for example, the idea of the entrepreneurial university does. And that's tricky stuff, because we cannot easily become other kinds of people. We cannot jump out of our psychological and sociological skins, as has been said. I was asked just before this this talk began, do I ever read McIntyre? Well, I do read McIntyre a bit, and here's here's a, a little bit of McIntyre. And I'm wanting to put this question, I'm wanting to open up this question here. Can we avoid undue pessimism on the one hand and seduction by what McIntyre once referred to as the self-images of the age? This is a tricky and demanding challenge for the imagination. It's not enough simply to imagine. And so we return to the earlier idea of feasible utopia. Because a feasible utopia, it seems to me, would be an idea, an imaginative idea, that is at once critical of where we are, where we're going, how we're heading at the moment, critical. It's deep, it's attentive to the deep structure of the university amidst swirling massive global forces at work uh, on it uh, around the world. And it is also optimistic. That's where feasible utopias will lie. That's the the corner of that box space where feasible utopias would lie. And the question then is, is there space for such ideas to be realised in the modern world? Can we really, does it make sense to dream up, even if we can, does it make sense to dream up these feasible utopias in the modern world? Or has the space for such ideas so shrunk that they could never be realised. Here are some ideas of the utopian imagination. I don't know what you think of that set of ideas. There are some I've taken from the literature and some I've injected myself. I don't know whether any of those grab your attention, whether any of them spark anything off amongst you we perhaps can come back to those if you would like but what I'm wanting to say is there are some ideas lurking out there that we could say are utopian 
They might even warrant this status of being feasible utopias. They might actually be realisable in the 21st century. So we have to put these ideas to some kind of test. It's, no, it's difficult enough to come up with the ideas, but that's not enough. We've got to put them to some kind of test. Are they going to have any substance, robustness to them? And so I want to put imaginative ideas to the test of what I would call criteria of adequacy. We have to judge them. We have to assess them. How might we assess any imaginative idea? I think we could assess it through these five tests. We could ask of any imaginative idea, does it have range? Does it warrant it being developed in the literature? Does it, can it be picked up, turned into our practices? Could it make sense in the best of all possible worlds to politicians? Could it, could it have a, 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 a resonance there in the public sphere? What range could it have? What about its depth? Does it attend to the deep structures of the university? But does it also, can we imagine it being actually picked up and reflected in the micro practices of universities, in the corridors, in the seminars, in the ways in which the university engages with the world? in its practices, in its ideas? And what about its feasibility? Could it be picked up and made sense of in the power structures of universities and their organisational complexity? Tricky stuff. Would it have an ethical dimension? Could it, could it lead on to human flourishing, a better world? And could it lead on to a better world at the personal level, at the social level, at the global level? And what are its continuing possibilities? Not only could it be actually made sense of here today, tomorrow, in, say, the University of Bristol, today, but how could it go on being developed? Could it be developed? Could it have life? Would it have flexibility, adaptability, emergence, emergent properties? These are severe tests of any imaginative idea. But it seems to me, unless we put our imaginative ideas to this sort of test, they're never going to come in to the public domain. It's no good academics just putting nice ideas into the, into the academic literature. They'll never be taken seriously unless they're shown to have some kind of robustness in the world. So these are severe tests. And people will say, well, if you bring these severe tests to bear against imaginative ideas, no imaginative idea will, will, will see the light of day because no imaginative idea will pass muster against these quite severe tests. But I want to say, no, on the contrary, if we bring these severe tests to bear against our imaginative ideas, they will help extend our imaginative ideas. They will amount to critical dialogue with our ideas. And they will help to legitimise this whole imaginative project that I'm trying to open up. And you might say, well, that may have some plausibility to it, but what about your own idea? Do you have an idea to offer us, Ron Barnett? Well, here's a Ron Barnett idea of the university, the ecological university. But the reason for putting this up is not to extend my ideas with you this evening of the ecological university, but to test the very tests that I've been putting up in the previous slide. But first of all, what is the ecological university? Well, in five bullet points, this is what the ecological university might look like. It sees itself within and as part of a global ecology. It sees itself globally and understands itself in, so, in the social terms, in personal terms, in terms of the interests of the world, the interests of the globe, global ecology. It does what it can to help the world to flourish, not just to sustain it. Sustainability is a big concept in the ecological movement. I say that's not enough here. We have to go further than sustainability. We have to help the world to flourish. What are we doing as universities to help the world to flourish? We then have to have a concern, and, or as Heidegger would have called it, a care for the world. Are we really, do we really have that spirit within us? This, is, this will be part of the ecological university, and it would be active and engaged with the world, reaching into the world. It's no good just taking a bit of Western, Western civilization, 
to the world. We have to be engaged with the world, listening to the world. We can't expect the world to listen to us unless we are listening to the world. And so we put our knowledges to work in the interest of the world. These are big challenges. This is a very broad and abstract, perhaps, idea of the ecological university, but it would have something of those features. Then the question is, how does it, how does it bear up against these criteria of adequacy? Well, you'll be glad to know we haven't got time to work it all through, but I think if you did the analysis... I think it would pass muster very nicely against our five criteria of adequacy, of range, of depth, of feasibility, of ethical dimensions, and of possible emergence. So I think the ecological university could be said to be a feasible utopia with robustness. Conclusions. We need to imagine the university anew. And the imagination, remember my, my earlier distinction, imagination and imaginary. The imagination comes before the imaginary. We cannot hope to form new collective sentiments of the university unless we put our brains to work. And it's jolly hard work. If anybody has tried to write a corporate strategy, I tell you, to think of a university anew, it's hard work in this way. Head in the clouds and feet on the ground all at once. We need lots of imaginative ideas and daring and bold and also profound thinking, identifying the best in the world for the university, utopian thinking. But this utopianism comes at a price, the price of responsibility. We have to attend to the world to show that our ideas are feasible in all sorts of ways. And so we form feasible utopias that are neither unduly optimistic nor unduly pessimistic, but hold out critical standards against which to test our emerging ideas of the universities. And so test us towards, help us towards new possibilities for the world university in the 21st century. The university just might be able to help us towards a better, a better world. And in doing so, the imagination isn't, I admit, it isn't a sufficient condition, but it may just be a necessary condition. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor Barnett. There's loads there to inspire us and to take away and reflect on. And I certainly hope that these thoughts do continue to break through into the kind of imagination and development behind universities going forward from here. Um, Professor Barnett has kindly agreed to take some questions now. Uh, We've only got this one microphone here. We haven't got a roving mic. So um, if you have got a question you'd like to ask, please could you just, um, when invited, stand up and speak nice and loudly and clearly and then Professor Barnett will will respond to you. You're good, Phil. (laughs) Sorry, please. Um, 25 or so years ago, there was a tremendous passion for everything to have a mission statement. And I can remember within this university, um, faculties and departments trying to adopt mission statements. And uh, many of them, I felt, were very much missing the point of what a university was all about. But I, I, I could imagine a suitably broad mission statement which could have a role in this imagining process, a role of evaluation, of ordering, of structuring the imaginative ideas. Do you think there is, and this is my question then, do you think that there is still a role for trying to analyse what the mission of a university should be, and as a supplementary, perhaps tell us what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've given you in, in five bullet points in my idea of the ecological university, a, a glimpse. But the, the key question is, what of this idea of mission statement? Well, I'm actually, I'm all in favour, believe it or not, of mission statements, but we have to interpret the idea afresh. A mission statement or a corporate strategy becomes, in my idea, what I would call a set of hopeful fictions. Hopeful fictions 
But if they're pitched at the right level, they're never going to be real. But they give us a start to steer at the bar, to orient ourselves towards. They need to be pitched at the best and most demanding at level. We've got to set big visions, big ideas for ourselves. And it's not easy. And the problem with the mission statements is that they have tended, I'm afraid, to continue the same old game. The, the mission statements very often tend to be simply projections forward from where we are now. Well, we've got this number of students now, so how many more students do we want in five years' time? Well, we've got this amount of research income now, how much more do we want in five years' time? And you build up a mission statement incrementally. I say no, we've got to abandon all of that way of carving out um, a, a new uh, strategy or, or a set of ideas for the university and be bold and imaginative. And that means also, probably, bringing the whole university with us and developing a debate across the university. I said that a lot of this is autobiographical. And when I had the challenge and the privilege of trying to be the primary draft of the new corporate strategy at the Institute of Education five years ago, we actually got senior professors together with, with maintenance staff in lunchtime workshops. We got them around the table together to think about where the university might go, where the Institute of Education might go. The Institute of Education, by the way, I'll give you a little bit of a sales pitch, the Institute of Education, why not? It's a, it's a small specialist institution, but it's a global player. It does one third of all the educational research in the UK. So it's already a global player. It's already got a, a, a position, a short. But the question is, where do we go in the future? OK, that's where you want now. Where do you want to go now? And what values do you want to to, to live by. How are you going to project yourself in the world? How do you want to be known across the world? This is not easy stuff, given the demanding criteria that I've set down. Thank you very much indeed. Most stimulates the breathtaking back to uh, in education. I wonder what your uh, assessment is of the ideal, which some of us had for a while in the 1960s and 70s, of the independent university, an adjective which didn't figure in all the lists that you gave us. The independent university as founded uh, at University College Buckingham, I haven't kept touch with this, but, uh, I did represent the state schools on the planning of that very exciting vision in the 60s and 70s when universities seem to be in chaos with so much disorder and uh, with students say teacher's life on their banners as they march around Bristol and other places. Well, that's a tricky one. I, I don't want to say too much about individual institutions because I can't claim to be an authority on individual institutions. But what I would say is that the question raises important issues about the relationship between university and state. And we're going to see these issues come more and more to, uh, to, to the fore um, in, in the coming uh, years. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I, I guess I'll happen to be finding myself in Chile perhaps these days. And it's very interesting in the literature of the commentators on higher education, how England and Chile are being put together in the same sentence well, like these days, as extreme outriders in the marketization of higher education. Um, and this is raising profound issues. I mean, to what extent are universities, state institutions in the UK these days, if 80% of their teaching funding is going to come through, through students. Um, there are very, I mean, it's a nice, it's a nice ABA question, by the way. Are, 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 are universities in the UK public or private institutions? Um, it's, 
it's not at all clear where, how we draw the lines. All of this is a roundabout way of saying that issues of independence and autonomy are very important and very complex. There's another dimension, though, a kind of more philosophical dimension of independence that's important. It's the French philosopher Derrida once asked the question as to whether or not we can form serious ideas about the university from within the university. Can we, can we ever bring off the wrong bar challenge um, from within the university? And, I don't, and, and it's very interesting, I mean, you heard that I'm now an emeritus professor and people say, well, uh, what effect does this have on And you know, I tell you, I, I'm writing in a, as much as ever, but I'm writing in a, I'm thinking in a free way. Universities these days, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a roundabout answer. Universities these days are characterised by what one might call busyness. I've just put a new subheading in a chapter I've just written in a new called The Congested University. Life is very congested in contemporary universities. We have to be busy all the time. Everything has to count, everything has to be working, everything has to have an impact. Dare, I've facetiously started in one chapter of one of my books with this question. Dare an academic be seen to be reading a book in their own, in their room, in the university? Because you're not, you're not exploiting the class properly. Um, so there's an issue here about how independence of thought and how we gain it. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a roundabout uh, answer, but there was another kind of that came in here. Um, I'm a sociologist, and most of my work in the last 40 years has been about utopias, and in particular, at the moment, I'm interested in the question of utopia as letters, so I'm extremely sympathetic to what you are doing. Um, I, I really have sort of two questions. One is whether the notion of a feasible utopia <coughs> runs the risk of placing too great a limit on what we might want to do. And it connects with my second question, which in a way relates to your last answer, which is that for me thinking about utopia as method is always a kind of sociological, requires a kind of sociological holism in which you ask what would be necessary for this to happen. And so I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how the idea of what a university should be is related to a broader concept of how we think the social world as a whole should be as a feasible utopia. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for a whole set of interesting questions. Um, and fortunately, the space, uh, I think I have legitimately here, won't allow me to do full justice to your, uh, your intriguing questions. But I'm very sympathetic to you because uh, certainly a critique of what I've had to say tonight might be as follows that um, it, it is really too. Idealistic in, in one way. And coming back to the previous question, that there isn't any space to think uh, and to act in the way I imply. Um, as it were, the sociology is against the philosophy. The reality is the real world in which universities have to duck and dive these days does not allow them to be utopian. Um, and that, that could be a, a, a critical starts, I think, against what I've had to say. But what I want to say is, in response to that position, that unless we try to be imaginative, we will never do anything different. The, the imagination has to come into play, and it is hard work. And we've got to do the hard work. And it's easy, and it's business of university life, to, uh, to, to, to miss out on the hard, hard work. 
as for the conditions um, that might allow the imaginative university, which is really what I'm talking about, to flourish, well, that's a real issue. I'm going to tread on a few toes. I'm going to ask a sharp question. Do we have university leaderships and stars of university leadership that are, as it were, facilitators of this kind of imagining university? And when, when, and some universities do have those sorts of collective dialogues that I'm talking about, and when those workshops are held, those lunchtime meetings are held, when open meetings and people come together to talk about the future of our university, to what extent are those points of view really taken on board? And to what extent the people who attend those workshops and open meetings feel open and encouraged to really say what they think? Or do they hold back because they think what they want to say might not quite fit? With the, with the dominant ideas in the, in the management team. I'm sure I'm treading on toes, but I'm saying sometimes we have to tread on toes. There's always a big joke that a great dullness is a accountancy. <coughs> um, I just wonder whether or not the Dean County uh, tradition has just sort of taken all the spark out of, out of the universities. All the sort of metrics and measurements uh, that teaching quality assessments really sap the, the enthusiasm for, for any sort of creative work. Now I wonder if you know, there's any evidence of universities in the Enlightenment, for example, that had similar sorts of bean painting exercises going on, or whether they were more free uh, to engage in, in academic pursuits. Well, again, very provocative questions. Um, here's a little, um, a bit of arithmetic in response to that question. There are now more staff at universities who are not academics than there are academics in British universities in the UK. Um, academics are a dying species in the universities. Um, and as I say, there is a business. I mean, one of the great joys about being an emeritus professor is that you can zap the bureaucratic email. And you don't have to read them. Not even you have to read the emails. You do not have to read the attachments of company emails. And you don't even have to download the attachments of company emails. So it's not just the numbers, it's the bureaucracy that goes with it. The thinning out of the form if you want to sandwich lunch in your room, and whatever it is. And, and if you go on, and it, it, uh, you know, you go over to France for one seminar for one afternoon, you've got to fill out the form to let the authorities know you're going to be in another country. And so on and so forth. For every movement, for every activity, there is now a pro forma and a procedure. So, the entrepreneurial university, it's very interesting, people haven't commented on this for long enough. Is accompanied by what I call the bureaucratic university, which is a different kind of norm. The entrepreneurial university shouldn't have any of this truck with all this bureaucracy, but it does. It's subtle with it, it's subtle with it. And, it, and we search it up, we need to understand why that is. And I think we can understand it sociologically. So the, the numbers game, which is tyrannical, tyrannical, uh, it, and it's had many times, you know, it's only the the ineffective and the, 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 the non-value-driven aspects of university life which we count. The real important things we don't count because we can't count. But that has to be put into this bigger context of the bureaucratization of academic life. And is it having an effect? It's a very interesting question, but we don't know. But it would be nice if some vice chancellors put in hand a little research project to try to ascertain whether all the bureaucratic developments, the managerial developments over the last 30 years, to ascertain what kind of effect they've had on that academic I haven't seen, I haven't seen this matter uh, examined seriously, seriously examined in the literature. I mean, there, uh, one of your former professors, Professor Reginald Dean, has done a lot of work on managerialism in universities. But 
this very issue of the effect that it ought to have on academic life. Um, I think has not yet been given the attention. Oh, sorry, we had that. that. Um, I find it very persuasive the sort of analysis offered by Alistair McIntyre about the modern university. And one of his arguments is it's the replacement of different metaphysics that generates the different models. So you get modernity, bureaucratization, capitalism, etc., following out of the philosophical trajectory. So my question to you would be this what is the underlying metaphysics of the ecological university? Because at face value, looking at the types of criteria you're giving, it seemed to me like it could go in quite a few directions, and maybe that's one of its values. But I'm also intrigued because the, the lecture is based on this assumption that there's a connection with religion and vision, uh, the Anne Spencer Memorial. So, um, is there a metaphysics underlying the ecological university that would recommend it? And the second question is, uh, what is your attitude to metaphysics at all? Because I notice, like, the virtuous university, which is McIntyre's choice, which seems actually far more countercultural and radical. Uh, I didn't know how that might map on to the ecological. So, let's do. Well, again, <coughs> important um, big questions. Um, I'm uh, quite keen, actually, on seeing whether or not we can resurrect in some of them. Here's a bit of theological language. Um, the metaphysical university, to see whether or not there's something learned in the idea of the metaphysical university which might still play out and have some significance for us in the 21st century. Um, in what many have called, have called, of course, a post metaphysical age. Um, and I'm being put on the spot and asked for my, as it were, undermining metaphysical position, if indeed I have one. And I need to go on working on this. What I would say is that I'm trying to work out a position for the university in an age of radical uncertainty. Is it possible anymore for the university to find a secure place for itself? in a world that's not only turbulent in terms of institutions and financial systems and technologies, but is unstable conceptually. It's unstable in terms of the way in which we understand ourselves. And I'm still playing around, beginning to play around, with, as you see, concepts of hope and faith. Is it possible to believe in the universe? Is it possible to have hope towards the universe? I don't have them very far in these speculations, and um, fortunately it wasn't part of my talk this evening, but that's, I think, as far as I want to go now. Um, I'm conscious I have more work, much more work to do on those things. Thanks for the question. Okay, I think I draw it to a, a conclusion. That's all we've got time for. I'm sorry about that. Class Barnet will be around after the lecture. Um, there's drinks just through at the back there. Um, do, do catch them over drinks if you'd like to continue the conversation. But I'm sure you'd like to join me again in thanking Class Barnet for his inspiring talk. And As you've already heard, there's printed copies of the presentation at the back. Feel free to grab one of those. Um, if you want to read more of his thoughts in, in greater depth, um, I can definitely recommend this book, Being a University, which was the 2011 publication, packed full of ideas and thoughts. And the latest one with the title, Imagining the University, is going to be out later this year.